Hello. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world, and welcome to this webinar presented by the Virtual Forge. My name is Matt Wicks. I am the co-CEO for Innovation and Technology, and we're going to be talking about innovation and technology. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us and hope that this guide to AI from stranger to business partner will be of value to you. We're going to talk about some of the kind of buzzwords in AI to try to demystify what they mean and simplify the process of how they integrate with business. We're going to talk about strategy and how you can use a high level strategy, applying things from a typical, typical project that you would do normally to an AI, strat an AI project. And we're going to talk about some of the kind of quick wins that you can make and take all the time. All the time, applying sensible business logic to what you're trying to do to create deliverables, to create measurables, but to enhance and get value from AI. So let's go. OK, so let's jump straight in with uh, before we start talking about strategy and approach and how you can implement AI for your business and make it your partner. Let's talk a little bit about some of the terms that are being used here, AI buzzwords and what they mean for business. So AI is a kind of conglomeration of a bunch of different things. And AI, meaning artificial intelligence, is the ability to make what seems like reasoned deductions or reasoned outcomes based upon the information that's provided. And this tends to be something that's done at scale, and it tends to lead towards what, what's become termed generative AI. In other words, the creation of new material based on old material. Whether or not it's truly creating new material or just repurposing elements of those of the of the previous material in, an, in a different way is, is quite an interesting question. However, at the heart of what we tend to talk about with, uh, with AI is uh, ML, which is machine learning. AI has been around for a long time um, and in, in different forms and probably the most common form is machine learning. So this is where data scientists take vast amounts of information, run that information across powerful computers and then use that information to be able to predict what are the outcomes or what might be the outcomes of, of a particular scenario. So in some situations, for example, where you're trying to predict the outcome of the premier league it's very difficult because although there are many many variables and you can you can rule some things out and rule rule some things in there are a lot of things there that make it hard to predict but in other things for example predicting the patterns of where in a city there is most likely to be unrest or in a refugee camp where are the places where it's probably best to, to, to build the camps and build the water places and and so on those are very useful aspects of machine learning predicting what sales should be put forward for which products should be put for, for sale in a company predicting which staff uh, which types of staff are likely to do best it's, it's fraught with difficulties because it's not a science and it's not an absolute science in the sense that it doesn't always give you 100 percent positive results it's basically giving you a weighted set of predictions and, and this is the thing with ai that is different from a lot of things when you ask it a multiplicity of times, depending on the settings that you have and depending on the options you have, you will get different responses. And that's because it's predicting what is the most likely response that it should give based upon all the various different parameters. So, as I say, AI has been around for a long time and we're going to be looking at a couple of examples of, of it in, in a moment. Um, we, we talk about um, the heart of it, though, the thing that's really changed a lot and become very popular since um, since last year has been LLM, large language models. So these are massive amounts of data that have been ingested by computers. And then these massive amounts of data are being used to predict, to create responses based upon the prediction of what should be the next word said. So for a, 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 that's a highly simplistic view of, of what it is. But for example, GPT, it has obviously the well-known chat um, tool, chat GPT, which and GPT is a large language model. ChatGPT is a tool that uses it. And essentially what it's doing is looking through the billions and billions of records that it has. And when you ask it a question, it's basically saying, I know that typically in response to this area of information, these words, I want to give an answer something like, like this. And large language models can be used for prediction. They, they are changing all the time. So when we talk about um, 
starting out with with GPT last last year. Since then, we've had uh, Meta's Llama has come along. We have Bard. We have loads of other examples that we're talking about, and all of these really are are uh, the large language models that define the the what tend to be kind of conflated a little bit with AI in in the public sphere. So whenever you're trying to build something with with for your business or you're trying to integrate AI, in, AI into your business, the chances are that you're going to be looking at either a service that's provided, which in some way down the line relies on a large language model or integrating a large language model itself. NLP, and, and this has become this has been around forever, forever. And, and it's really become the thing that's the game changer effectively for AI. NLP stands for natural language processing. So instead of having to use text speak or computer speak or do a search using wildcards and quotes and capitalized ands and so on, you can speak to the, the system, to the AI, like you would to any other human being. And if you think about it, it's been around for ages, smart speakers, Alexa, so on. You know, you've been able to, to Say, hey, Alexa, when's my stuff arriving? Which is an example of natural language processing. It, it don't, stuff doesn't really mean anything. It's not a precise query, but it allows, it can be interpreted and enriched by the information that the model knows about you in order to come back with a response that is likely to be the correct one for you. Um, it's also worth saying that underlying Alexa, there is an AWS service Lex, which has been an AI service that's been around for five to six years, I think now. Um, so this part of it has been around before. I, I guess what we're seeing now is the combination of machine learning, large language models, NLP, all into a way that's consumer accessible and business accessible, which is why it's suddenly become the hot topic. So deep learning is really the the... The way in which a computer, an AI, can be trained to mimic the human mind. It's the process of not just absorbing information, but being able to make connections, being able to make inferences, being able to create sort of interpretation. Now, obviously, there are limits on this with AI as it is at the moment, but it is the it is the bit that differentiates it from rote learning, if you like. It's not just learning that two plus two equals four. It's learning that if you add two numbers together, you create a third number, and therefore there are all sorts of things you can do around the possibilities of that. Computer vision is another part of the, of the tool set that AI has. So NLP is very good for processing language. Computer vision is the visual part of that. It's the ability of AIs and computers to be able to understand what is in an image, not just down to this pixel is blue, this pixel is green, but to be able to identify objects, to be able to identify faces, to be able to identify whether or not the image is potentially pornographic or harmful in, in some way. And this is the field called computer vision, used everywhere in very real circumstances nowadays for things like um, number plate recognition. You go into a car park, very often you don't have to get a ticket, or if you do, you don't need to use it to get out because it's using number plate recognition, crowd recognition at, at games, at football games and so on. Another phrase that's becoming quite popular at the moment, um, and is an important one I think is RAG, retrieval augmented generation. So when you talk to a large language model like ChatGPT, you are basically saying, you know, um, how do I do this? And you're you're asking it to make use of the information that it already knows in order to tell you how to how to do something. So I might say, for example, how can I change a tire? The 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 large language model will almost certainly have the information trained in itself to be able to answer that. But when we're looking at the business context, we actually want to be able to give it more information at the time of questions, not retrain the model again on a whole bunch of new data, although you can do that, but to actually to actually send it some information and ask it to make a reasoned assumption based upon the knowledge that it has and this context that we've provided from our own documentation or our own images. And that's what retrieval augmented generation is. It's the ability to pass in documents or images from your own system, your own sphere of influence or, or anywhere else, and have that perform the context of what the AI is going to answer in this particular question. So there are, these are the key things to consider when you're building up an AI strategy. Uh, and, and there are many others, but these are the kind of key planks that we're going to talk about. You have, first of all, data. 
the the underlying data of your system that's going to provide the information to the AI. You have the integration, how much you want to integrate with your existing systems and services. You have platforms, which AI are you going to choose and why, or AIs are you going to choose and why? And security, which kind of ring fences everything. Is your system secure? Is your data secure? Are your user secure? Is the AI secure? So each of these has a different series of things to think about and to, to work through. So let's begin by looking at um, a data, first of all. So it all begins with data, quality of data, timeliness of data, governance of data, availability of data, security of data. AI may be the new kid on the block, but it's the old problems which will define its success. And in many ways, AI isn't really the new kid in the block. It's been around for many, many years in different forms. Uh, and, and it's been kind of ubiquitous for quite a long time in different ways, as we'll see. However, underpinning all of this, the ultimate thing that will drive the success of your project is the quality of the data that you provide to the AI. Now, if all you're doing is using an off the shelf chatbot to answer questions, then the quality of that data is the data that it's assimilated itself by training, typically by ingesting lots of information from the internet. However, in most small, medium and large enterprises, what you actually want to do is to utilize the functionality on your own material that you don't want to make public, you don't want to make available. So therefore, the quality of the data that you put into something is really important. One of the examples we'll see a little bit later on is taking products and labeling them. So specific products that are your products that you produce and being able to teach the AI to identify those products. In order for that to be successful, you've got to have a sufficient number of images that are correctly labeled. You've got to take into account things such as um, diversity. And, and by diversity, I don't just mean kind of personnel diversity, diversity of images. For example, if I were to, to try to compare two types of uh, of car, a Model 3 Tesla and a Model X Tesla, and all my Model 3 pictures were white and all my Model X pictures were red, the AI would then learn that red cars equal a Model X, whereas a picture of a Model 3 in red might not be that. So you have to consider things like that. You have to consider the privacy of the information. Where is it going to be stored? Who's going to have access? If you have permissions on documents, so if you're building something which is an AI which interrogates documents, not just the documents that are returned, which are governed by the permissions that exist, but you have to make sure that it's only answering questions based on the documents that you have permissions to see. So therefore, the question that I ask maybe may get a different, even if you ask the same question, may get a different response based on the permission levels for the information that I have accessible information to. I need to be able to govern that. I need to be able to understand the underlying issues if there are any uh, data related issues. I also need to understand that data uh, can be interpreted in a variety of different ways by humans and, and therefore it can also be interpreted in a variety of different ways by uh, an AI as well. So it's the old problems, it's governance, it's data quality, it's data availability and it's data accessibility. Can this information be given to the AI in a timely format? And, and there are new problems to consider with that as well because you have to decide how much data you provide, how much context you provide, and trying to teach it which bits of the context are most important versus which bits are just peripheral as well. Okay, hey, integration. How much do you want the AI integrated into your existing workflows and processes and, and by expansion into your existing systems and documents and data and so on? This is a really important strategic decision. Are you going to create a reliance on a still young technology? Because it is young. You know, AI has been around, like I said, for quite a long time. But the large language models and the modern things that we're thinking about as, as AI really kind of surfaced from ChatGPT just over a year ago. And if you look at the models you're likely to implement now, they're probably going to be even less than that to a handful of months around. Will short-term savings mean long-term de-skilling? Um, are you going to be building your strategy as a purely AI strategy, or do you have elements where you can back out, where you can revert, where you can say, actually, this isn't the right tool for this job? Do you have those checkpoints? Are you going to invest in the skills needed to manage and diagnose issues with your AI pipelines? So there are, there are different skills needed here. There are the skills of the infrastructure, orchestration, and data cleansing, as before. You have the skills of building the model, the skills of understanding how best to create the prompts or the questions which are asked, how best to manage the chunks of data that get passed into it. If you're going to train a model, 
how best to train that model and how best to validate the results and how best to keep retraining that. And those are all skills that you need to have as well have it within your organization or, or close by. Is there a static strategy of a gradual rollout with stakeholder gateways like any big IT project? I think there is a there is a tendency with AI to say, yeah, we're going to go for AI without thinking about, OK, what are the specific checkpoints that we need to achieve? How do we measure success? How do we make sure all stakeholders, whether they're SMEs or whether they're technical stakeholders, are aligned with the progress of this rollout and that we are measuring success in the same way as we measure success with everything else? How does this chime with the race to use AI? Because we all know that there are these conflicting directives of, yeah, AI is great. We can save loads of, we can increase our productivity. We can save loads of money by using AI versus I'm a bit nervous about AI. How am I going to get this out there? How are we going to use this? What are the risks? So how do you how do you balance those two things to utilize it, but to be cautious and sensible in that approach? And Microsoft have a very good uh, AI readiness document. Uh, do you understand what is happening to your data? Do you really understand where it's being held? What processes it's going through to be able to, to be used to generate the information? And, you know, each time it's generating a slightly different answer to your question, for example. Do you know why? Are you able to control that? Um, and, and so on. And most importantly, if you're going to hook it into other systems, how much access to it does it have? How are you going to use this AI or these AIs, these services, in order to respect the permissions that you have already existing and yet fully get the value from that, that system or those systems? Platforms. So there are so many. Fabric, Reflake, OpenAI, Bedrock. Google Cloud, ChatGPT, Bard, Chat. Um, th there are many, many platforms to choose from. And within these platforms, there are many choices to make. Do you want to take all the service? Are you trying to make use of just a little bit of it? For example, you know, Alexa has been around for a very, very long time you know, as a tool for being able to communicate. Underlying that, you have uh, an AWS service called called Lex, which allows you to do speech to text and so on. Do you want to just use that? Do you just want to use image recognition? Do you just want a chatbot? Do you want fully featured document integration? Do you want to create workflows that allow you to automate tasks in that are either highly repetitive or relatively straightforward? All of those are important questions and drive the platform that you're likely to choose. Sometimes the choice is obvious. For example, we already use Snowflake, so it would be it would be sensible to leverage its bold new AI to talk to our data. It allows you to communicate with the data itself. If you've already got Snowflake, you've already got your ingestion pipelines, you've already got your governance, why would you not then do that? Likewise, you might say, we're a Microsoft company. Microsoft are pushing AI right, left, and center. Copilot is everywhere. You know, why would we not use that to, 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 to build into our Word documents, to build into our Power BI demonstrations, to build into our Azure pipelines? You know, those things are there. But just because it's there and available, I think you should still build a strategy around it. Like, why are we taking this? What does it add? What are the costs? What are the skills? What are the outcomes? How do we measure it? What is success? Just like everything else. And really trying to understand the short and long-term costs. What are the costs, for example, of licensing this now? What are they likely to be in the future? If you have the, there are different ways of hosting your, your AI models. Are you hosting them as a surface? So what are you paying per question? What are you paying per word? What are you paying if you host them internally for the, for the GPU instances, the big computer instances that you're going to be using for these? Really getting to grips and understanding the cost is part of the strategy. And it's very important to separate that out from the, rush to market and the shiny new features. AI is phenomenal. What it can do is phenomenal, but it's just like any other tool in your toolbox. You need to have a strategy. You need to understand the platforms. You need to understand the costs of those platforms and the skills needed to support them. And security almost goes without saying this one. And, and you know, it's on everybody's everybody's thoughts as far as AI is concerned. You know, is, is AI going to take over the world? Are we going to get into a Terminator-like scenario I think the actual security aspects are the same security aspects as, as trouble uh, technologists and governance people and data people all, all the time, which is who has access to my documents? What are we doing? Can I audit what's being done? So 
is the AI saving my data, whether it's anonymized, generalized, or specific elsewhere? Are the responses segmented in some way so that people are only receiving the information they need? This is what I said earlier about, you know, I, I, I can search these documents, but is the AI searching everything and then giving me that information? How can I control that? Is what be, is what's being generated appropriate? Is, is it something where we have been generated fake content or, or rude content? There are loads of things now to put guardrails around it so it's not demonstrating abusive content. You can control what's called the temperature, which is how much a uh, an AI will hallucinate, as we'll see later on. Um, is it using copyrighted material? So was the model trained on copyrighted material? So GPT, OpenAI, is, is, is being sued by at the moment by uh, New York Times, amongst others, I think, um, because the the original model was trained on corpus of information from the internet, including the New York Times content, which it feels is not fair use, whereas OpenAI, of course, feels it is fair use. Um, so there are there are lots of and there will continue to be lots and lots of um, legal challenges because obviously if what you're trying to do is teach a child, which is your model, everything in order for it to be able to give you good answers and education, you need to give it everything in the first place to learn from. And different models use different sets of, of data. Part of your strategy needs to be to understand what was it trained on, what are the potential risks um, to, to either reputational company there as well. Is the process for managing hallucinations and recording inaccurate information? As I said, hallucinations are where it creates just fake information, just made up information. But because we believe it to be authoritative, we take that information as gospel and use it outwardly. So being able to register in being able, first of all, to alert people that the information may be potentially incorrect. Uh, but also being able to register that information, record that information and manage the outputs of that information is really important and tweak your prompts or your questions in order to reduce and minimize the amount of that. Those are really, really important things when we consider security as well. And there are lots and lots of different elements to that, both from the point of view of the data ingestion, the guardrails that an application puts around it and the, and the responsibilities of the service provider in there as well. OK, so we're now going to take a look at some of the uh, real world examples of how this can be applied on a very, very simple level for, from a business perspective and how you can start to uh, investigate the things and the effort and the, the proof of concept that's necessary to drive forward the building of a strategy. And as always, if people want to get in touch after this and have conversations about the actual reality of, of performing this and creating these, we'd be delighted to talk to you. So start with computer vision. Um, so this is using Azure uh, custom vision. So this is AWS is the same. Google has the same. They all have different varieties of this. But it's just to give you a very quick example of how easy it is to label products to enable your website or your application to quickly identify that where your brand or your products are being quite specific. Often these examples are very broad things like fruit or, or things like that. Here we're going to be a bit more specific and try to tell the difference between different versions of the same product. So I'm adding here a bunch of images. So these are all Teslas. So these are Tesla Model 3s that I'm adding here. So I'm uploading the images. And each time you upload images, you have to label them. The more images you upload, the better the results will be. We're just using 15, uh, sorry, 11 here. Um, so I'm just taking these images very quickly and I'm labeling this one as a Model 3. Notice I've chosen different angles of shots and different colors and so on to make sure that the model doesn't develop an unconscious bias towards one particular type of thing. Again, more of the Model 3 here, et cetera, et cetera. Running through very quickly, labeling up my Model 3s. Now I'm going to go ahead and add in a group of Model Xs. So exactly the same process, uploading the files, going through and labeling each of the images correctly with an, uh, a Model X um, example on there. So this is basically teaching the model or informing the model, labeling the items for the model to then be able to be trained to identify the difference between these different product types. And this could you were doing cars here, but obviously this could be anything that I want to have as a product so that my business can quickly identify or learn to identify in different photos the different elements. So these are all my images that are tagged. I'm ready. I'm going to train it for, for speed sake. I'm just going to use quick training. Uh, advanced training will allow you to take longer. It'll cost a bit more, but will give you even more accurate results. But for the purposes of this demonstration, it doesn't need to be super, super complicated here. 
Okay, and it's going to tell me once it's been identified. Run through, there we go, it's training, takes a few minutes, takes I think about four or five minutes in this particular case to be able to be trained, which is essentially running recognition, testing to see if it's correct. It makes a prediction, it checks with the data to see if it's correct. It, it tweaks the prediction, it makes a prediction, it checks to see if it's correct. And it trains itself time and time again uh, to make sure it's getting better and better results until it he hits the, the limit of the time that we've allowed or the maximum accuracy it can get to. So here it's getting, you know, 60, 70% accuracy, which isn't brilliant, but for a quick four minute model and 14 or 24 images, it's not it's not too bad. So now let's, um, without going into detail about all of those individual uh, meanings, those, those, let's take an example. So here I'm going to find a picture of my own car, which is a Model 3. and upload that and i'm going to see if it recognizes it and there you go it's a 99.8 percent chance that it's a model three and it's a 0.1 percent chance that it's a model x which is exactly right um now this is obviously one very very quick and simple example but the point about this is is nevertheless important that you know in a, in a matter of four or five minutes i've been able to create a model i've trained the image recognition algorithm to be able to identify two different product types to a fairly good degree of accuracy. Obviously, you can then link this into applications so you can have your online app able to identify things. You can use it to see where your models are appearing in, in on Instagram or TikTok and social media and so on. So there's a variety of things that you can do in this particular area. Okay. It's also worth saying that we have a couple of excellent blogs which go into a lot more detail on the subject and we'll be linking to those in the notes for this webinar. Okay. So let's take our second example. This is an example of what I refer to as RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation, which is a product that we at the Virtual Forge have been building. You can find more information at mycontentscout.com. Uh, and this is simply a good example of using natural language processing to interrogate documentation. And this documentation is all in our own sphere. It might be information we brought in from external sources. It might be only our internal information. I can only see what I want to see. Sorry, I can only see what I'm allowed to see. Um, and I can ask questions in natural language to be able to answer them. So we store all of our internal processes and webinars that we've had uh, internally on our system. So here, for example, I'm asking the question, what is Business Central? This is a webinar done by Creative Computing. Great partners of ours did a great webinar. And you'll see on the left-hand side, I've asked the question. On the left-hand side, it's come back with an answer generated from the documentation by the AI. Now, documentation is using this case. In this case, is a recording of the webinar. And you'll see here, it surfaces the recording, surfaces the video gives me frame shots of, of every frame, every few second frames and words that have been identified in that particular frame. So AI here is identifying the context and the objects inside. It's doing some analysis of the text. It's telling us the transcript, what was, what was in the transcript at any point in time. Um, and it's basically allowing me to quickly fo follow through, see all of the individual speakers and quickly get to the point in which I want to understand and learn from what I'm, what I'm looking at. So and if I've seen something in the webinar, think? I can and make a use universal of it very quickly. mobile enabled user experience actually means that you have the same. I can jump around in the webinar. And we'll see here that actually, when we get. And all this generated on the fly by AI understanding using the retrieval augmented generation of documentation based upon analysis that's already done on the video to be able to generate this context and context, content and context for me. Okay. Another example here, we also allow, as well as documents and, and audio, of course, to search, we allow to search dashboards, so Power BI dashboards. So here, I'm looking for reports on the Eurovision Song Contest winners. And what you can see here is that I've been able to find that those results. It's come back with the best match, and it's showing me what data points there are within the dashboard itself, of the various tables that are used to make it up, the dashboard, again, according to the permissions assigned to me, and it also enables me to be able to see that context, that very real context, um, and open it up and take a look at the data in situ from this single dashboard point. 
We're happy, of course, to uh, go into more detail, much more detailed demonstration for anybody who's interested. If you look at our website, mycontentscout.com, it has a lot more information in there as well. Um, but that's just a quick taste of retrieval augmented generation. And the final thing I wanted to talk about, just to show you how easy it is to start to understand the large language models and, and the underlying methodology behind all of the AI, I wanted to take you through a tour of large language models and how to find them simply and easily on a particular website. And so the last thing to mention here is large language models. There are loads of large language models that you can download to try out and play around with. Hugging Face is a very good place to go to to see um, all the different types of, of models that there are. You can see the ones that are trending. You can see, you know, you can, with each one of these, you can simply investigate it. You can read all of the content. So this tiny llama project aims to pre-train the 1.1 llama model on 3 trillion tokens, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it gives you information about how to use them. Quite often with these as well, um, there are little tools that have been created um, which allow you to play around with and test out those um, those languages. Uh, so for example, here, let's, let's take one, I'm looking at the Falcon 7 B Instruct. So this is a, um, this is a, a model that's been built in the UAE based on the Falcon 7B, 7 billion. So it's a Falcon large language model trained on 7 billion tokens of information specifically designed to follow instructions. So it's quite well um, set up. So I, I want to know, for example, what are the benefits of a vegan diet? And it will do exactly what you would expect it to do um, in, in there. And you can control how many things there are as well. You can also <clears throat> um, generate completely nonsensical information as well in there as well. Uh, and obviously, this is just giving you the, the small amount of information available at that point. And then you can you can look through and you can say, OK, here I want to use the 40 billion model uh, 40 billion token model to see there okay. okay and so let's round this out by looking at some practical examples of short-term business uses and remember when we're talking about a strategy we're trying to create short-term business uses that deliver results that have measurable impact that can show return on investment and that can be managed in short achievable clumps of, of work. So um, customer interactions, this is a very popular one, which is being used a lot at the moment. So this has been around for a long time, online chatbots. They've got a lot more sophisticated by the ability to very quickly be able to ingest your documents, ingest your, your frequently asked questions, bring in corpuses of online knowledge so that that's a very good way of opening the door, using those and monitoring customer feedback. You use a low temperature so that the AI doesn't create a lot of um, additional information. Um, and, and so that just in time learning, this is another good example that that, that my content scout in particular is, is perfect for. So rather than pushing learning to users and trying to keep up to date the system consumes the information it's there whether or not we use it internally for our own policies and training material and so the user can find out what's the policy on this what is what is how can i do this where can i find this all those sorts of questions that are very practical very useful and just speed up the process of somebody kind of trying to run through things uh, document auditing. So this is something that's that's very big at the moment in, in legal tech and so on. So this is where you have, obviously there is the ability to generate and create documentation, which is legal and legalistic. However, you also need the ability to be able to check and validate human completed forms that are, that are there. So a good way of doing this, we use this in our warehouse in, in, in America, is a way of auditing and understanding the information that's been manually input and flagging anomalies within a, within a, within a document or a set of documentation. This is also very much linked to fraud detection. And here we're moving into a much bigger process, really. But fraud detection is something that's being used a lot for both from a financial and from a legal perspective. Being able to amass huge amounts of information, looking at multiple, multiple billions of transactions over a period of time and spotting where things look unusual. And also, of course, for things like understanding um, 
IP attacks, understanding denial of service attacks, understanding hacking of systems, both of those can be used using anomaly detection. Um, and and um, most this, this can be available as either an internal model or you can train a, a, a cloud based machine learning model in order to do this. Process automation. This is kind of a low level ongoing one that's been going on for, for a long time. Typically, when we talk about process automation, we might be talking about RPA robotic process automation, which is very much a kind of click and drag and build your process. And then it's repeated multiple, multiple times. Effectively, what AI allows us to do is to talk to the system in a way that describes our process in human terms and then let it figure out all of the bells and whistles to create that automated process. And that's a nice one because you can build things at a very, very granular level that have immediate and quantifiable time saving effects. Personal assistance, again, this is something Copilot from Microsoft um, and, and lots of other tools. I, I want to book my holiday. You can go now to a lot of travel sites and they will ask you a few questions and go away and kind of um, come up with the holiday or learn from your previous experiences and, and do that. But within a kind of small to medium enterprise, a personal assistant can be something as simple as email everybody in the Delta team to be able to tell them that uh, I'm on holiday for the next two weeks or something as simple as that. Uh, it really is is um, as straightforward as that. Uh, I personally use it a lot for just dictating a swathe of text and then having it turn it into a proper formulated document that I can then edit. So I'm still doing a lot of the work but it's taking away a lot of the grunge part of it, which is there. Content generation, very big in marketing at the moment. And obviously one of the things that there is a lot of uh, social media talk and energy around at the moment, content generation is basically the ability to create content based often on your existing content. And although it's a new piece of content, it takes it's derived from something which, which pre-exists. Uh, you know, this is one where AI as a service tends to tends to, to to work out and it's a relatively low cost um, way of putting your toe into the AI waters. And finally, research bots, these are something that I think will increase over time, whether it's competitor research or subject matter research or, or, or whatever. And if you look at, for example, with my content scout, we have a, a research bot companion coming along. And this is essentially the process of being able to go out, trawl lots of information, um, assimilate that information, make judgments on that information and bring it back to you, but in a way that is, is still searchable back to the source. It's, it's attributable. And, you know, so if I'm reading a piece of research that my research bot has brought back, it's going to make certain assumptions. I might challenge those assumptions. And I also might want to validate where that information came from and so on. Capacitor, capacitor analysis is very useful for because um, you know, quite often the information that it's bringing back from a competitor analysis isn't going to be something that's um, that's going to be life threatening or life shattering, but it's going to be something that helps inform inform our decisions and drive us to know where we're going to look at. So instead of researching twenty competitors, my research bot can research those, and then I can go into detail on the ones that I think are most interesting. So there we have it. That is the uh, quick 101 view of AI uh, as a business partner. The the want to round off with the checklist of things to consider when you're trying to build an AI strategy. First and foremost, understand your use cases. Understand why you need AI, where you need AI, and what it's going to give you, and importantly, what it's not going to give you. And also, um, how you're going to implement it, and what are the deliverables and the um, and the ROI. Be realistic about your data. Uh, if you are building something on top of your existing ecosystems, the same problems as you've had kind of trying to do analytics and all of those things, they may well still exist. You still need to have a robust data governance process and a robust uh, process for understanding the movement of the data around your organizations and breaking down silos or maintaining those silos, depending on what is the best um, for you. Understand the cost of the large language model you're using. So this is not just the direct costs of the uh, purchase of the model or the subscription to the model or any of those things. It's it's also potentially the cost per token of, of querying the model or and the cost of running the GPU instances that it runs on, plus the skills of the people needed to maintain it and the 
uh, the, the, the new upskilling of people to be able to utilize their new skills in this area and build an ongoing assessment roadmap like you would with anything else. Have gateways, understand what success looks like. But because this is a constantly changing field, the speed at which you need to make those reviews and pivot and change and change direction and absorb or not absorb new new things that have become available to maximize the growth of your AI strategy is really important and is a big difference from a traditional long form project. You know, it, it is a much more to use a software development word, agile way of working. You still have the end goal in mind, but the ground may change under you as you're working. And that's it. So I'd like to thank everybody very much for their time listening to this webinar. I hope it's been of value to you in some way. We're always happy to take questions, which we'll do in a moment. Anybody who has any questions, please feel free to hang on and ask those questions. But also, if you want to reach out to us, then the information is on the screen or any of our sales team or myself will be more than happy to respond directly. We'll also put links into the blog that I mentioned and to the My Content Scout site. So once again, let's, let's head over for questions and thanks very much for listening.